Hello, everybody. Welcome this afternoon, and thank you for asking me to present on Age Fruit, the new science of living a longer and healthier life. I'm Roseanne Kenny, Professor of Medical Gerontology at St. James's Hospital and Trinity College in Dublin. And a lot of what I'm speaking about will be um, the substance of a book I produced in January. We as humans have been vexed for hundreds of years with the mysteries of longevity. How can we extend our lives so that they're happier and longer, but healthier? And I think a good example of this is the Chinese dynasty, the Tang dynasty, approximately between the years of 600 and 900 AD. This was the most civilized period of Chinese time in, in, latter, in latter years. And in that 300 year period, culture was supported, education was supported, competitive places for the civil service were mandatory so that they were, it was ensured that leadership in Chinese society was of the highest intellectual quality. There were 22 emperors during that period of time, yet six of the 22, 25%, over 25%, died of self-poisoning, died over those 300 years from taking concoctions created by their alchemists, which the alchemists assured them would be the answer the elixir of life, the answer to maybe eternal youth. But of course, the concoctions included very toxic agents like mercury, cinnabar, sulfur, gold, and hence six of 22 emperors died. And not just the emperors, many, many noblemen also died because what the emperor does, everybody does. <clears throat> so it took that long despite the level of sophistication and intelligence in that society, it took 300 years before the penny dropped that this elixir wasn't working. What I'm gonna share with you today are other solutions apart from mercury, cinnabar, gold and sulfur for healthier lifespan. Solutions that we have control over and that are certainly not toxic. Um, and as, just as, Chinese society in the six to nine hundreds onwards, just as then, we now are very much engaged with identifying solutions for healthy, longer lifespan. Silicon Valley's billionaires want to hack the aging process. Billionaires are getting on anti-aging uh, research. And their, their concept is, can aging be cured? Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos influence, have invested heavily into aging research. And the reasons are that we are living longer, but people want to live better longer lives so that they're independent right to the bitter end. Although we as a society are living longer, there have always been a proportion of populations or societies who are over 65, three to 4% for most of human history that we've got information on. So although Socrates himself in 400 BC had to, uh, had to terminate his life because of uh, his philosophical beliefs, nonetheless, his three best friends all lived into their late 70s, early 80s. We know that that was the case, again, mostly for the intellectual, the educated, the thinkers, and, and those who had a good quality of life, but good socioeconomic standing also. Today, in contrast to the three to 4% in BC, 22% of Germany and 26% of Japan are living beyond 65 years. And here you can see a really good example 
of how life expectancy has increased over time and how much it's increased year on year since accurate records started to be kept in the 1800s. So since that period of time, expectancy, life expectancy has doubled. And the increase equates to about 2.2 years every 10 years. And as you can see, it continues in a linear fashion. And there are very few countries in which that is not the case, where the top of that linear association appears to be attenuating. In most countries, it appears to be continuing. And in about 10 years time, 12, to 13% of the total world population will be over the age of 65. Now this, just to kind of put this into our pragmatism and, and understanding what this really means. It means that a baby girl born this year will on average live three months longer than her baby sister born last year. That's what that life, extended lifespan translates into. A remarkable uh, achievement for society. The other notable thing is that the proportions of people over the age of 65 has overtaken the numbers globally, worldwide, under the age of five. This, of course, may have human resource implications, but certainly implications for labor force participation, um, age of retirement, in other words, human resource implications for provision of health services, for example, etc. The biggest increase we're going to see globally is in the over 80s and the over hundreds, where you know the number of people over the age of 100 will increase by 400%. When I was a young junior doctor, it was really rare to see anybody aged 100 on the wards, but now it's not. It's not, it's commonplace. Why are we living longer? Certainly better healthcare, immunization, but also much more advanced and advancing everyday technologies, improvements in our antibiotics, better quality of water. The quality of water and hygiene are probably the two biggest factors over the last couple of hundreds of, year, hundreds of years, which have influenced lifespan, but also better food quality, more knowledge about the factors which influence healthier long life, better housing, more prosperous lifestyles, and generally more prosperity. Now, Whereas extended lifespan is wonderful and to be celebrated, there are cautions associated with these observations. And one of them is that we will spend one fifth of our life with some degree of disability. A disability by that uh, definition is a chronic disease which influences our absolute independence and mobility. So let's just, that's the demographics. That's how much life expectancy is increasing. It's a huge change in our global demographic. It means that there's a big voice for older people, but, but it also begs the question of what we can do to ensure our own lives are as free of significant disability as possible, but also to get the message to much younger people because everything I'm about to say now applies to the following. The earlier you start intervening for healthy longevity, the better. Nonetheless, it's never too late to start. So let's take a step back and look at why we age at different rates, if we do, and how can we measure this? There's two ways of looking at age. One is our chronological age. That's our number, the number of candles on a birthday cake. The other way of looking at age is biological aging. Now, these six men are all around the same chronological age when the photographs were taken, but you can see they look very, very different. Some certainly look older than others. Why is that? Apart from plastic surgery, of course, or cosmetic surgery. 
but why is it biologically that, that they appear to be older? And it's because of the influence of factors during our life course, during our life experience, which affects our biological aging. And if we could actually capture some of the biomarkers, the, the factors which predict aging, and couple those with an understanding of the causes, we might be able to personalize interventions for a ind certain individual which can extend healthy lifespan. None of us in this field are interested in extending lifespan indefinitely. That would be, frankly, a disaster for the world. How could we cope with populations which continued indefinitely? But certainly to try and ensure healthier, better quality of life for individuals is important. Babies, when they're born, babies pretty much all look the same. It's as we develop and as we experience things throughout our lives that our biology is influenced and that bit by bit, some of the negative experiences maybe influence our more accelerated aging and enabling their, or making us therefore look a bit older compared to others who don't have the same negative life course experiences or haven't engaged in the same negative life course habits or, or are just resilient for other reasons and therefore appear to be younger than their years. How can we actually measure this biological effect apart from just looking at photographs like I've shown you? Is there a way we can measure biological aging? And there is. And I equate, we've got trillions, trillions of cells in our body. And if you imagine that our cell is kind of like a washing machine, all our cells are about is production of energy. Production of energy when we take food in and then the, the cell takes that food in its various forms and uses the mechanisms, the engineering within the cell to create energy and energy is our life force. Energy keeps the cell alive. Energy keeps the cells functioning and making an organ like our heart or our spleen or our liver or our gut function, makes it work. So production of energy is pretty much all we're about. But of course, as with the production of any energy, there are toxic byproducts. And the whole secret to aging and successful aging of that cell is to produce energy as to the maximum capacity of the cell, but to get rid of those toxins as fast as possible. That's why I think a cell is like a washing machine. You put the clothes in, start the wash, that's producing the energy for the cell, but in cleaning those clothes and producing the energy, the water gets dirty and the dirty water has to be got rid of as fast as possible. Otherwise, accumulation of the dirty water keeps some of those clothes dirty, accumulation of toxins in the cells, makes the cell function less efficiently and eventually the cell ages and dies. We know an awful lot about the aging process and about the biology of aging and the biological markers which indicate faster aging or accelerated aging from twin studies. So if you've got monozygotic twins, they both share the same genes, but, but may have had different life experiences as is in the case in these two photographs. So these people are aging at different rates. On the left, in both photographs, the twin looks younger than the twin on the right, even though they're both the same age. Now they have the same genes, so something has gone on that isn't genetic, which has aged this person and this person more than their identical twin. And we can measure that thing which went on by measuring biological clocks. Biological clocks tell us 
the age of a cell. There are a number of different ways of looking at those clocks. And we know from those biological studies and from the twin studies that we age at different rates and that contrary to public opinion, only 20 to 30% of our aging process and our lifespan is due to genes. The rest is about the exposure during life course to various habits, behaviors, stresses, etc. things I'll go into in a moment, which we term at a high level as environmental factors. So environmental factors are responsible for about 80% of our lifespan, in contrast genes for 20%. Lovely study which has shown this is the study from New Zealand, the Dunedin study. And in this case, they took um, children born from birth, all born in the same year, so a thousand newborns, and followed them. And this year they're celebrating their 50th anniversary. They were, they were all born in, in um, the year 1975. And when these biological studies were done, the participants were all aged 38. So their chronological age was all 38, all the same, because they'd all been born in the same year. But their biological aging was hugely different. And it varied, even though they were all aged 38, from a biological age of 25 to 30 to a biological age of almost 50. So some people had accelerated aging biologically. And we know this from measuring those clocks I was talking about in the cell. That's how we were able to measure, or they were able to measure the biological aging and showing even as early as 38, this huge disparity in biological aging. And what's also interesting is when they looked at all of the different organs and the different physiological systems in these 38 year olds, they found that accelerated aging was present and evident in the endocrine system, their thyroid, their, their pancreas, was, was evident in the metabolic system, the gut and absorption from the gut, in structural um, dis disorders such as impaired heart function, or muscle function and blood pressure, et cetera. So the point there is that when they looked at all of the different systems, those who had faster aging biologically, measuring the clocks, had faster aging in all of the different systems. It wasn't just in muscle or in heart or in gut or in endocrine, it was all of the systems, suggesting possibly a common mechanism for the aging process. But the big things, which drove faster aging in these 38 year olds was poverty, poor education, bad health behaviors early on, such as smoking or drinking or drugs, or adverse childhood experiences, divorce in the family, depression in the family, depression in the individual. They all accelerated the aging process. So environmental factors matter and they start very, very early on influencing the process. But the good news is that the things which accelerated aging in the Dunedin study are things we've got control over. And as individuals, as particularly in adult life, we can control the factors that we now know accelerate aging and slow down therefore the aging process. Relationships are really important, the quality of relationships. I've put it in the biggest bold capital here, letters here, because you'll see in a moment that actually the quality of your relationship and the frequency of good quality relationships is probably the most important thing to, to give you quality um, aging. No stress, low stress. Stress is bad for us psychologically, but those psychological impact of stress has a knock-on effect right back to the cellular level and to energy production. Oxidative stress in a cell is, is the accumulation of toxins in that cell, which puts the cell under oxidative stress. So the more antioxidants we take in diet, et cetera, the better, but also stress relief or re low stress is an antioxidant. Quality relationships are antioxidants. 
having a purpose in life, which is why the Bialtana Festival is so important <clears throat> because it introduces creativity and purpose and um, intergenerational engagement and communication and quality relationships at a community level. Exercise is very important and is also an antioxidant. Low weight, heavy weight is really not good for us. White fat cells associated with heavy weight are toxic, toxic to the body, and they accelerate stress in cells in the body. So all of these, the, the, the good side of these, quality relationships, anti-stress, lots of exercise, having a purpose in life, low weight, are antioxidants. And if we don't have these, and toxins build up in the cell, it triggers an inflammatory response in the cell, puts the cell under oxidative stress, and ultimately our cells die, which is what aging is. So we don't want that. And what can we do about it? Well, if we go back to the blue zones to actually try and understand a little bit better the aging process. And there are five zones in the world called blue zones. They're only called blue zones because Michel Poulain, who was the first to describe them, used a big blue marker to delineate the zones. Um, these are the zones where a high proportion of people live over the age of 100, but they just don't live to more than 100. They live well without chronic diseases. And they're in Loma Linda in California, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Sardinia, Italy, Icaria in Greece, and Okinawa in Japan. Look how far apart they are. Yet they share a number of features in common, which have thereby informed us about the factors which influence healthy aging. And we'll talk about those features in a moment, but you can see even looking at this, that some of the features are they're all by the sea and they're actually all on a height. And even though they're so far apart globally, they share these factors. And this is just re-emphasizing that a high proportion live to over a hundred, but they remain really well into their nineties and don't suffer chronic diseases. And I remember seeing a video that Michelle Poulain showed at a conference once of a woman in her mid nineties chopping wood in the morning, something she did all of her adult life and continued to do. Um, and this is just to emphasize how complicated the autonomic nervous system is, which is the background system of our nerves, which is ticking away all of the time, which is influenced by stress. So if we get stressed, the sympathetic nervous system increases its activity, the parasympathetic nervous system reduces activity. But what happens is we get an increase in heart rate, an increase in blood pressure, and an increase in steroids, cortisols in the system they all put extra pressure on our organs and on our systems. It's fine if it happens quickly like that in response to an acute stress or acute infection, and then all of those factors go down to baseline again. But if we're chronically triggering this autonomic system, that level of stress to the nervous system puts stress back onto the cellular systems. Um, and having good levels of neurotransmitters, the hormones in the brain, which cover our brain function, and high levels of good hormones, and low levels of stressor hormones, and low levels of autonomic sympathetic activity, is what we're trying to achieve by introducing peripheral factors or beneficial environmental factors. And some of those that we've known through the blue zones and have been replicated elsewhere, are how important it is to be in nature. Nature has a very relaxing, attenuating effect on the exaggerated components of the sympathetic system. That's the bad, fast system. So being a part of nature and introducing physical activity into your life, but as a component of life with frequent walking, gardening, houseworking, loads of, loads of evidence to show how beneficial walking in nature is, not just because of the physical activity, but because, of, because nature has a calming influence on us, as does gardening. Forest walking, even in cities, 
is now becoming very popular. And Japan has particularly led the way globally on introducing green spaces with forest into city areas for the calming well-being effects of these green spaces. Forest bathing is what it's known as in Japan. Being part of a faith-based community adds four to 14 years to life expectancy. The world's longest lived people have close friends and strong social networks. And being part of a faith-based community enhances that. You share with others, you meet. It's a ritual to meet every day and to share your problems, but also ex positive experiences with others. We need that as gregarious animals. Having close and strong family connections is very important and part of that same continuity of quality relationships, quality friendship. It's been well shown in experiments of the background autonomic nervous system and beneficial hormones that being part of positive intergenerational experiences is really good for our stress systems and reduces stress at an external level, at a neurological level and, and in cells. Grandchildren particularly are very important to, uh, to grandparents as grandparents are to grandchildren and sharing wisdom. Having a purpose is, is very important. And um, if, if we lose pur purpose, it puts extra strain and stress on the neurological systems and hormonal systems. So many people when they finish work, feel that their purpose is gone because work was their raison d'etre. So it's important to plan for retirement, but also with each day to make a purpose. We can, you can make a purpose, getting up in the morning and making a list even which includes shopping and washing or whatever. That's having a purpose and putting a purpose into your day and make an effort to meet people as part of that purpose. If you can reach out, that's also important. It's important insofar as possible to try and plan for retirement if you're going to introduce volunteering, et cetera, before you retire. Most people don't actually um, start to volunteer after retirement. According to our TILDA data, the Irish Longitudinal Study in Aging, we have shown that it's those who had engaged in volunteering pre-retirement that we're most likely to continue as post-retirement. Doesn't mean it can't happen. And volunteering is a great way to give one purpose and also to enhance our society generally. The Blue Zones put so much emphasis on purpose that they have special names for it. The Okinawans call it Ikege, having a purpose, Ikege. And the Nikoyans call it Plan de Vida. So knowing why you wake up in the morning makes you healthier and happier and adds seven years to extra life expectancy and enables us to remain active and working well into our 80s and 90s. Something else that all of the Blue Zones share and which we know now from many other cultures is very important for healthy, better aging is having downtime, having a period of time during the day where you downshift. And the other, the cultures have different ways of, of, of doing it. The Adventists pray, as I showed you. The Icarians take a nap. Sardinians do happy hour, always with, with friends. Gardening is a good way of, of de-stressing. And one lovely study which compared gardening and reading measured in two sets of students, their neurological system activity and hormones before, and then allocated them to either gardening or reading, and then measured those neurological activity systems and hormones after the activity. And in both reading and gardening, those stress levels, be they nervous or hormonal, had reduced, but much more so in gardening than in with reading. But some, any de-stressing activity which you enjoy 
and can make into a daily ritual is important. It may be yoga. It may be meditation. It may be meditation even for five minutes in the afternoon. Try to do something. <clears throat> sleep matters. Sleep is, is, is very important. And as we get older, we sleep less. Um, and we're inclined to wake earlier. And of course, wake more times during the night. So the one thing I say to patients that's really important, first of all, about sleep, is don't worry about the fact you're not getting sleep because the worry will be much worse for you than not getting regular sleep. And then to try and introduce things which one knows does enhance sleep for everybody and just make your sleep experience a bit better, even if it's not perfect. This is a very good example of the bad effect the blue light has on us. And these are different uh, blue light exposures from console games, PC games, online chat, email, and other PC use. And down here on the x-axis, we see hours of use of those technologies. And here on the y-axis, the duration of sleep. And the bottom line here is that sleep duration declined the higher the hours use of blue light technologies was. And the decline in sleep duration was worse for email use than console games, for example. But it was still bad for all, and it still declined significantly for all. So reduce blue light use, that'll help sleep, and try not to expose to blue light for an hour before bed. Plant-based foods, uh, the populations who live longest predominantly eat plant-based foods. It doesn't mean that red meat is bad and you shouldn't eat red meat, and there's a lot of debate about this at the moment, but the consensus currently is that the more vegetarian the diet, the better for our systems. That's the current wisdom. Um, so vegetables, fruit, whole grains, nuts, pulses and beans are the cornerstone of most centenarians' diets. Very important, however, the diets are almost universally free of sugar, free of salt, added salt, <clears throat> and low in refined grains or any processed foods. And fish, we know, is very good for us. It's part of the Mediterranean diet. And the Okinawans off the coast of Japan, they have a lovely expression to eat something from the land, in other words, vegetable, and something from the sea every day. They also use a lot of ginger in their cooking and turmeric. And in fact, the de-stressing ritual in Okinawa is a ginger tea ritual, ginger and green tea ritual in the afternoon with, with friends. Now, one thing they also, all of these blue zone hotspots, longevity hotspots, share in common is they don't finish everything on the plate or they don't eat until they're full is more accurate. They eat to 80% satiation. Remember, it takes 20 minutes, 20 minutes for the brain to signal what you've taken in in the gut. So eating slowly is really important and pausing, eating small portions and waiting between portions so that you register how full your gut is in, in your brain. Now, caloric restriction or intermittent fasting is very topical. And there are animal studies to show that it is a benefit. These are two rhesus monkeys. And in this particular experiment, a group of monkeys, all born the same year, like the Dunedin study, were randomized, one to normal diets, one cohort, and the other to 40% reduction in their caloric intake every single day. Both monkeys are now 20 years old, but look how old this one is compared to that one. This one could be its 
offspring. The nose is not as expanded, it's not as big, the mouth here is drooping, it's got less hair, the eyes are sadder and more sunken, whereas this one is vivid. That's the calorie restricted monkey and that's the standard diet and it's even more obvious from the side. That's the calorie, the, the standard diet and that's the calorie restricted diet, tail up, back straight, much stronger and more ample looking. So the message here is calorie restriction, be it through intermittent fasting or through just a reduction in your calories is important. And we know now that obesity and excessive metabolic rate is bad, is bad for the aging process. If, if people are finding it difficult just to calorie restrict, there are calorie restriction mimics. Resveratrol is one we can take, it's polyphenol. Metformin, the jury is still out with metformin and we're waiting for trials to come to fruition, as is the case with fesetin, quercetin and rapamycin. Rapamycin certainly is very effective. It's probably more toxic than any of the others. It's used in conjunction with chemotherapy at the moment to enhance the effect at a cellular level of chemotherapeutic agents. But the one that you can take very safely, because there are high levels of resveratrol, for example, in strawberries, is resveratrol. Uh, there's a good evidence emerging that metformin might work, but it's not recommended as yet, because although there's evidence that it may slow the aging process, there are also a couple of animal and now human studies showing that if you don't have diabetes, which is what it's used for, it's a diabetic drug, and if you don't have diabetes, its effects aren't as good, and in fact may be toxic to some cell systems like muscle cells. So not recommended just yet. Obviously exercise at any, stage, at any age is very good. You can introduce exercise even in, in nursing home patients and, and it's shown benefit. Um, it's of value. Remember that we don't exercise enough, none of us do. Um, sitting down is not good. Sitting for long periods of time is not good. We should stand or walk every 40, 45 minutes. Um, we know from longitudinal studies that people who've introduced uh, physical activity, people over 50 who introduce physical activity, it actually slows down vessel thickness and vessel stiffening, i.e. the two causes of heart disease, heart attacks and stroke. So at any stage, physical activity has a positive benefit at a structural level. Unfortunately, one big public health study in the UK showed that people there spend longer sitting on the toilet than they do exercising. Remember to stand up. Remember to stand up when you're sitting. So don't sit for more than 40, 45 minutes without standing up because standing up reawakens our whole autonomic nervous system in a beneficial way, that nervous system that I showed you and ensures that the system keeps blood flow happening to the brain. Prolonged sitting, sometimes we might stand up after prolonged sitting and feel a bit dizzy. It's because we've let that whole autonomic system become dormant and we're not getting enough of blood flow to the brain then when we do stand up. So you have to keep reminding your brain and your body that it's important to keep blood flow to the brain by standing up. And resistance exercise programs are very important as we get older, as well as aerobic. So fast walking or running or rowing or cycling, they're aerobic exercises, which are very good. But resistance exercises is needed to build muscle capacity. We lose 1% of muscle strength every year after the age of 45. And social engagement and friendship. I started off by saying how important quality of life of, to quality of life's quality social relationships were, but they affect heart disease and death rates. And this is a huge meta-analysis, which has looked at that and shown in almost 400,000 people that you're 50% more likely to survive if you have stronger social relationships and the risks for survival late into life, healthy survival, were the same as those of stopping smoking, or I mean the, the benefits of stopping smoking or re reduction in alcohol or increasing your physical activity 
or reducing cholesterol. So the benefits of quality social relationships are huge. And we know that social relationships act through inflammation. A couple of animal studies have shown that in animals, in macaque monkeys, who are kept separate from their friends, and like us, they're gregarious creatures, that, that when they looked at the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes are sort of the, the engines for inflammation and inflammatory genes in our body, and when they took a small biopsy of the lymph nodes in the friendless monkeys compared to the monkeys who were continuing to engage with their friends, they found that inflammatory genes had been upregulated in the friendless monkeys, making them much more likely to have oxidative stress in the cells and inflammation in the cells. They also showed that fibrinogen, um, clot, which is a clotting protein, was much higher in friendless monkeys. So keep your friends and ensure that you've got good quality and frequent relationships with friends. And social engagement and quality relationships is very common in people who volunteer and groups who volunteer. In the TILDA study, again, we showed that volunteering and social participation and looking after grandchildren was associated with a much higher quality of life, with less depression and less disability. And finally, remember, you are as young as you feel. I love this. Um, very often people one meets will say, well, I am 65, but I feel 45. I know it's crazy, but I do. Well, it's not so crazy, actually. Our research has shown, this is led by Deirdre Robertson, and I was the lead author, and has shown that if you, if you have negative perceptions of how you're aging, in other words, we ask people what their age was, their chronological age. And then we, then we asked, what age do you feel? And people who felt younger than their chronological age, even when we'd adjusted for everything that might influence like that, like whether they had arthritis or blood pressure problems, whatever, when we'd adjusted for all other physical and brain components, people who felt younger were younger in terms of their walking speed. And not just there and then when we were asking the questions, and doing the examinations, but we've been following people for 12 years now, and we've shown that your how young you perceive yourself to be actually has a long-term impact on slowing down the aging process. Not just for physical aging, but also cognitive aging, memory was better, concentration was better, etc., for people who saw themselves as younger. And one study that nicely showed this was the nun study. These are sisters in Minnesota, 678 sisters of Notre Dame. And a, a scientist called David Snowden followed them from age 80 onwards until death. And they all uh, in a, allowed post-mortem studies and detailed pathological studies to be done on their brains as well as body organs. So this is the sisters from the order when they had just taken their vows in their candidate years, they were all aged 20. And what they did in that candidate year was write a letter before they went in, which expressed their experience during the candidate year. And Snowden, 60 years later, when he was examining all of these nuns aged 80, had access to those letters aged 20 and produced this wonderful study. And what he showed was that the nuns who had a positive attitude at age 20, but also who had more social engagement and more optimism and more activity during their lifespan, had much less dementia in death. And actually, because they were examining brains, they were able to show that even for the same level of neuropathology of dementia in two brains, one of the nuns' brains which, which was, was that of a nun who had had painful loneliness during her lifetime. That nun had shown clinical evidence of dementia during her lifetime compared to this nun who had good social activity and engagement and never seemed to, to have dementia. 
didn't have dementia clinically, but both of them had the same pathology in their brains. So somehow being socially engaged and positive protected against dementia in, 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 in the nun who had those uh, attributes. A healthy lifestyle and an active lifestyle and a stimulating intellectual life led to a healthy and independent life later on. And certain traits in the 20s predicted whether someone would have Alzheimer's disease 60 years later. And this just gives, gives you an example of those traits. This is when they were in the candidate year. This is one nun, sister one. I was born in September the 26th, 1909, the eldest of seven children, five girls, two boys. My candidate year was spent in the mother house teaching chemistry, second year Latin at Notre Dame. And with God's grace, I intend to do my best for our order, for the spread of religion and for my personal sanctification. This is the second nun. I was born in September 26, 1909, the eldest of seven children, five girls and two boys. Oh no, this is the next one. God started my life off well by bestowing upon me a grace of inestimable value. The past year, which I've spent as a candidate studying at Notre Dame College has been a very happy one. Now I look forward with eager joy to receiving the holy habit of Our Lady and to a life of union with love divine. And you can see how that's so positive, a high positive emotion, whereas the previous sister had a low positive emotion and was much more likely to get dementia uh, later on in life than this sister. So positive attitude matters. Believe you are as young as you feel and you will have a healthier, longer life. Stay mentally active intellectually curious, make sure you have purpose. I've put a lot of this into my, my, my book, Age Proof, and you're very welcome to get it online um, or an audio version uh, if you wish. And thank you very much for um, enabling me to speak with you today. And I'll now take some questions. <laughs>